It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, December 15th, 2011. I am James Burns. We now go to Bob Chapman. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how are you doing today, sir? Uh, you got the wrong guy here. This is Star Wars. Oh, it's Star Wars. Hey, Star Wars. How you doing? <laughs> what, did you call to order a pizza, Star Wars? <laughs> no, no, I called the wrong number, actually. And I got another one of the fellows I'm on with on different times as well. And he wanted to talk, so it's a good thing I called early. <laughs> I understand that. Charmed life I live. I know. I mean, you're on so many different shows, it's... Hard to keep it all tracked. I mean, if it was me, I probably would screw it up every week. <laughs> well, the thing I dread the most is every three months having to make up the new schedule. You have no idea. Wow. It's it's terrifying. I can only imagine. I mean, I mean, you 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 got it all organized because you've been doing it for years. But you know, like, if I if I had to do what you had to do, I'd probably be like, um, okay, I think uh, this one, bye, bye, bye. And then I would call on the show like, oh, oh, I'm not supposed to be on until tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> I'd keep forgetting. I had somebody call me and remind me this morning, so I go in at the right time and I can't get through. And so only, uh, finally, after about 15 to 20 minutes of calling, oh, uh, occasionally I, we have phone problems. <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> Every once in a while we do. But, well, I mean, sometimes I am. Yeah, just every once in a while. It, it happens, kind of like what, what transpired last week. I mean, it's just the way technology is. I mean, that's kind of like going into, I guess, in the more positive aspect. I mean, it's also very, very probable that, you know, somebody out there might be intentionally tinkering with things, our gremlins. Well, we do have that, and there's no question. I know a jammer when I hear one. And we've been jammed. Yeah, and there's times whenever they don't want you to know about certain things or talk about certain issues, and they'll they'll do what they can to try and, you know, railroad us and sabotage our efforts to get the message out there. But, I mean, I think they're losing the battle in that regard. Well, I think they're uh, losing in the big way. The program that I'm on after this is a marine disquisition. Uh, I think I've been doing it about eight years. <clears throat> and I've caused the government buku problems, let me tell you, because I get feedback from all of these guys and gals who are spread all over the world. And on Blog Talk, it's the biggest program by far and has been ever since it started. And uh, that couples up with a tape that's going to be uh, in Friday's issue, which is a link. And <clears throat> it's uh, discourse by a veteran who's still close to people who he used to be with in the military. And uh, he bears out the same thing that I'm being told, that men of all and women of all rank are saying, you know, uh, I joined to protect my country, but what are these people up to? I mean, why are we doing this, this, and this? This is not what we were trained for. And so we have this great dynamic negative discourse individually going around among the top units in the militaries. It's not only the uh, the Army and the Navy, but the Air Force and the Coast Guard. And, and so there's a lot of probing, mental probing out there, especially with this legislation that was passed last week, which could make us all terrorists. And uh, these uh, gentlemen, for the most part, uh, are saying, no, we're not going to do that. And the comment I've, get, I've been getting is the first person who injures or shoots or kills a demonstrator, uh, we're going to tell the unit, uh, you either turn them over to us or we'll liquidate you. So that's what it's come down to. So all you people in the military out there is people who think just like you do, and they don't want 
the military messing with the public when they shouldn't be. And a push comes to shove, you're going to get plenty of volunteers in the military. If they're not trained, they can still cook, they can still clean up, they can still do the latrines. I've been there. I've done it all. And so uh, that's the way the, the, the military runs is on its tummy. And uh, so have heart. Uh, we're behind you. Absolutely. I mean, I have nothing but the deepest respect for all men and women in uniform that have chosen to you know, swear the oath of the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And I hope that they've taken that seriously because something you've been talking about for a long time now, and I've been discussing a few years that I've been awake to all this, is you see all this unfolding in front of us, just like with what, we, what you were just mentioning, the National Defense Authorization Act, which passed the House yesterday by a vote of 283 to 300, I mean 136, and then in the Senate a couple weeks ago it was 93 to 7. A total of 376 traitors passed this bill. And uh, Obama, who originally said that he was going to veto it, of course had a 180, and now he's planning on signing it sometime this afternoon. And that's a good thing that we still have the First Amendment left. What little shreds of it we have is that there are men and women in uniform right now in the military having this discussion. And this is seriously one of the last nails in our republic's coffin, and we need these people to stand up, Bob. Well, I've got the solution. And it's pretty simple, and it was right in front of you. Everything that we need to be done will be done by Ron Paul. So we've got to elect him and people like him. There's another uh, money bomb on Friday, which is tomorrow. And I'm committed for $1,000, and I want everybody else out there to commit for as much as they can. He does not have J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, et cetera, et cetera, to give him hundreds of millions of dollars to get reelected or get elected. And we've got to help him. Uh, last time we had this, it was $7 million they collected. And this is, <clears throat> I haven't contacted anybody in the Paul group. I'm just doing this on my own. And I want everybody who can hear me to see if they can come up with $1,000 and and uh, we got to reach that $7 million again. He needs it because it looks like he may very well take Iowa and New Hampshire. The polls are turning strongly in his favor. So, please, you're saving yourself by electing Ron Paul. Because if he's not elected, you can kiss it goodbye. I agree entirely, Bob. I mean, we are in serious trouble if we get any of these other puppets, whether the Republican or Obama, reelected for another four years. And, you know, the next two days are very important for the Ron Paul campaign. Tonight, of course, is the uh, Fox News debate. And right now he's trending actually really well, third place on Yahoo. So a lot of people out there on the Internet are talking about Ron Paul. And this money bomb tomorrow, the Tea Party money bomb, is huge. I mean, back in 2007, they raised about you know over six million dollars, and they're really trying to get up to that level in order to keep going with the campaign. And you know whatever people can donate, because I know it's hard times, and you know most people don't exactly have that kind of money laying around. But whatever you do have will help the cause. And the really cool thing about the Ron Paul website, the campaign, is that you can you get something out of it because you can go to the campaign store, Bob. And you can buy signs, stickers, push cards, and that counts as a donation. Then you get that stuff in the mail, and then you can hand it out to your friends and your families and neighbors. I can't do that. Well, you can't, but, I mean, the, the American <laughs> citizen can do Everybody in this country can do that. If I get one of those that. signs, they say, hey, que pasa? <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> hey, who that is? <laughs> now they all know, believe me. <laughs> you know, the rest of the world doesn't live in darkness. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the average person throughout the planet is unfortunately a, a bit more in tune with what's really going on than the average American citizen. I mean, it, it's sad to say that, but it's the ugly truth. Yeah, and you better pay attention because it's going to be in the lives of many of the people that you know, maybe even yourself, and your progeny for uh, generations to come. These people that you see up there donkeying around in their $6,000 suits, all of those people 
want to enslave you. And if you want to be enslaved and have your children told if they can marry so-and-so, if they can have children, where they're going to work, where their children are going to be schooled, where their wife's going to work, what house they're going to live in, if they're going to be given a vehicle or they're going to use a bicycle. I mean, this is not something I dreamt up. I've been reading this crap since the early 1950s. This is some serious stuff. These people need business. And they aim to win because if they don't win, they're all going to jail. And I love it when they monitor all my programs because I say it on every program. No more Mr. Nice Guy. We're coming to get you under the law. Definitely. And, I mean, you're not, you're not making this stuff up, Bob. I mean, all you got to do is look at the situation in other countries. I mean, look at what it was like under the Soviet Union. Everything you described a moment ago, where you could live, who you could marry, what kind of vehicle you had, what kind of occupation you were going to take, that was dictated by the government. And that's the direction we're heading here. Well, I think uh, the Soviet Union, as well as the uh, formation of fascist Italy and fascist Germany or Nazi Germany, uh, were all uh, trial runs. Uh, the closest to what we've got today is what Hitler did. And, of course, the Soviet Union was formed long before Hitler came to power. And I guess that they figured that wasn't all that good a model. And, but the, the, the Nazi model is what they're going to move on. And you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't make any difference. It's bad. And I don't want to have to deal with it. And if we don't elect Ron Paul, there will be revolution in America. And I want to promise you, I will be back. And these people don't want to deal with me. I'm one of the crazies out there who's old, who's going to die anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if it comes to that point, you know, we, we have nothing left to lose. And it's two alternatives. Either A, they eventually come for us, as you've mentioned, at 3 o'clock in the morning and drag us off to a FEMA camp. Or we go down fighting. And if I have to pick between the two choices, Bob, I'd rather go down fighting with my arm swinging. Well, the idea is to get law enforcement and the military on our side. And uh, if we have to, we'll join them. And I'm, str I'm strongly behind that. And uh, as I said, if you're not trained, there's plenty of jobs you can do. And uh, fortunately, I've been trained as old as I am. I can still fire like mad. And so, you know, with that said, we don't want that, but we're ready. And uh, the military is the key to this, and we need them desperately. And we need them to tell government that is not a lawful order. And we refuse to follow it. And if you move against this, we will take over the government. And, and that's another positive sign in this darkness is the fact that of all the candidates out there, Obama, Romney, Newt Gingrich, Perry, Ron Paul is getting more money coming in from men and women in uniform than the rest of them. And that is a great sign. They never let up. They're relentless. Because if they miss... They miss it all. They give up everything they've got, and they know it. And they think they're, well, they're far smarter than we are, and they're wrong. Believe me, they're wrong. Yeah, I, I agree with that statement. I think the elite, you know, for, unfortunately, have gotten to the point where they know there's no going back for them, and they're in it to whatever end, whether they succeed, which I don't think they're going to, but I, I seriously think that they realize that they, they have no other way to go. They, they can't, if they back down now, then <laughs> there's going to be, you know, you know, massive takeovers of governments throughout the world with, you know, awake people aware of them and have been educated as to what these criminals have been doing for far too long now. And we're going to come after them through the long arm of the law. You know, there's, it's interesting. Uh, most I would say 99.9% .9 of Americans are not aware of this unless they read my publication, The International Forecaster. But uh, there's double trouble here. Not only is it coming in the form of Ron Paul, but it is also coming in the form of Marine Le Pen in France. 
And were she to win the presidency, it would be like thunder and lightning because she said the first thing she would do is get rid of the euro, the European Union, go back to the French franc, and live the way the French want to live. And all the, thir the third thing was that she would put an end to illegal immigration, and they would all be removed from the country. And uh, the situation in, in, in France ethnically has gotten very terse between the Muslims and the Frenchmen, we'll call them. And uh, I see real trouble blow, uh, brewing. And it's very, very important she won that election because you might call her the female counterpart of Roland Paul, but old enough to be his daughter. And I, I got to give you a disclaimer here. The Le Pen family is our family is very good friends of mine, and I've known Maureen since she was 19. And um, and so it's I have to be fair and tell you that I'm a little prejudiced. <laughs> But nobody else would do that. You'd have to go find it out yourself. That's very true. And it's actually a really great endorsement for her coming from you. Well, I hope she hears. I know when her father ran and got defeated, he said, you know, I wanted you to uh, run the Treasury for us. And I said, well, uh, maybe next time. But, I mean, there's definitely that sense of uprising happening throughout the world, not just in the U.S., but, you know, throughout other places as well. I mean, especially with what's going on in the Eurozone right now. I mean, with the, the latest uh, issues going on there. We'll get into that right now. I mean, their situation is continuing to uh, get worse and worse with each passing week. And it looks like there's a, a, a fracturing happening between the U.K. and the E.U. Well, there's, um, there's two ways to look at that. Number one, you have to say to yourself, why would E.U. members, uh, better yet, Eurozone numbers, Eurozone 17 countries out of 27, so there's 10 that have their own currency. Why would they just want to tax transactions in the city of London and not elsewhere? And it's going to run around 15 to 20 percent, which means that business that was being done in London that doesn't want to pay that tax, they might go to Frankfurt, the second largest um, financial focal point and um, and it's not a natural thing to do especially under the circumstances I mean why get England mad well they did it and it could have been straight up they wanted the, the taxation and they wanted the business to move to Frankfurt who knows but there's a more sinister side to this and I'm only guessing I'm not one of these commentators that comes on and gives you a song and dance and says that's the way it is when they really don't know. Feature this. The German people, ever since the beginning of the EU, 65% have not wanted to belong to it. In, it was some 10 years ago now, in the Eurozone, we had... 71% um, of women and 66% of men were against having the euro in Germany. Now, with that said, Germany has done extremely well, and France has as well because 50% of each exports go to each other country. So the balance of trade is about even, which is, you know, the optimum, so to speak, under trade circumstances. And France is in serious financial trouble. Their banks are broke. Uh, some of the German banks are broke as well. Probably all of them. And, but France is in no position to resuscitate. Uh, Germany is. They, they can make it, but if they do that, they can't bail out the six countries. And for, if France gets lowered in their rating one or two levels, it's a kiss of death. They can't either. They can't help it themselves because of the cost of money, nor can they help the other six nations. And I think the Germans realize it, and so do the British. And I think there's a good possibility that Germany wants out. 
and this is their way of doing it. And with the British vote, that means that they can't pass any legislation without that vote. It has to be 100%. And so where is this leading to? It could be that the Germans come up and say, well, if they can't change the vote, we can't come to an agreement, uh, I guess we've got to leave the uh, Eurozone and the European Union and you stinky, thinking people out there. Uh, we don't like you anymore, and we're going to do our own thing. And that could be what they're up to. So you, you've got to look at both sides of everything. That's very true, Bob. I agree entirely. And it, I don't think it's just the Germans that are fed up with the EU. I think, like you mentioned, it's also the French. And I believe you know, the people in the United Kingdom, I think there's a large growing uh, portion of the populace there that won out. I mean, up until this point, Cameron has basically been – you know, kind of a puppet saying, no, we're going to stay in the EU, even though they, they want out. But it seems like now, I, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes in London. I don't claim to know, but it does seem like he's, you know, starting to, you know, go the other way. I mean, maybe, I mean, there's just, it's possible that there's such a large anti-EU movement growing in England and Wales and Scotland and North Ireland that eventually, I mean, their their puppets in government may have no choice but to capitulate to the will of the people. Well, I'll tell you, the people in the Republic of Ireland aren't too very happy either. Uh, they assumed, uh, and their politicians sell them out, but they assumed the debt that was caused by the banks, and the banks are on the continent, or in London, and why they did that, I'll never know. It was totally unfair to the Irish people. But the biggest questioners are the people who are in Parliament in Holland and in Finland. And I would be very remiss if I didn't tell you we have several people who are in both parliaments who are subscribers to the International Forecaster. And uh, we also have, you won't believe this, but in London, the Rush Islands are subscribers. <laughs> so with that said, um, I, I think there's an interest in what I've got to say. <laughs> But anyway, the Dutch are the most outspoken. How I know that, I talked to a reporter, oh, it must have been about six months ago. And he said, I started talking to them, uh, these representatives from Holland, and they were there uh, at this uh, meeting in Brussels. Uh, they having to do with this sort of thing. And so what happens is that... Uh, <clears throat> he starts talking to them, and they come up with all these answers, and, and, and to him, all of the right answers. And he said, well, how do you know all this? And the guy whips out this piece, pieces of paper, and he hands it to him. He says, I know this guy. He said, I get his publication. <laughs> and they said, that's right. And so here are some of the people in the parliament get the international forecaster. And so, and the same thing happened in Greece when uh, <clears throat> Michael uh, Lewis was there. In fact, he uh, quoted the fact that he found this out in the article he did for Vanity Fair. And then he had me in this book, Boomerang, that just came out. I guess it's on page 79. I haven't seen it because I'm not close to the United States, so I, I just can't go to a store and pick up the book. And uh, anyway, um, uh, the word is getting around. Uh, the instance that Michael Lewis cited was in Greece uh, with the um, Greek, Greek Orthodox Church and the monks. And uh, I guess they're on Mount Scopus or wherever they are. And uh, nowadays you don't know because they get an email address. But they told them, yeah, we're subscribers. That's how we know everything. <laughs> so it's a small world, and I'm, help, I, I'm happy that I'm able to help people see through the darkness out there uh, so that they'll understand what's going on and from someone who's not going to lie to them. Well, I'm, I'm glad that there are people in governments and in high positions 
you know, throughout Europe that are, you know, subscribers to the international forecaster.com. And I sincerely recommend that um, our elected officials here in the U S uh, consider doing that as well, because <laughs> they might actually learn something. But unfortunately, I, I think that most of them are, are so corrupt and brainwashed and bought and paid for that. I mean, I think they're beyond all hope. Well, I talked to an attorney this morning who's been a subscriber for about 15 years. And uh, he knows a lot of people that I know or has through the years. We're getting old now, so everybody we know is dying. And uh, he told me a story of, uh, of someone uh, who was a very powerful political figure at, um, was Shanghai, uh, politically and financially because he was uh, against something that the majority of politicians wanted passed and had been paid to get passed. They destroyed this guy. Now, mind you, this guy was the Speaker of the House in a state, and they destroyed him. So this kind of work is not for the faint of heart. I mean, you've got to have brass, and you've got to fight this all the way to the end, and you never give up. And this poor soul, um, he'd seen a lot because he came from a very, very tough section of the city. Uh, and In fact, my father and his brother and mother were born on that street in the middle of that part of that city. And, uh, but he never ran any, up against anything like this before. Dealing with the mafia was easy. At least they had a code and with that said, you've got to be tough. We're out there being tough for you. Uh, you supply the support and the money for Ron Paul, and we'll live happily ever after. It won't be easy, even if we get him in office. But you have got to. You must back this man. He's the only hope we've got left through legal means of changing government. And, and that is the sad reality there, Bob. I mean, these people... Are, are far worse than the mafia, as you pointed out. I mean, they, they make the mafia look, look tame by comparison. And we are, we are at the precipice of this whole thing, the, the last chance for us to peacefully turn things around this country. I mean, it's, it's come to this, basically. Either we get Ron Paul in the White House or we're going to continue to go down this path. And it doesn't matter if it's Obama another four years are Newt, Romney, Perry, or some other puppet because they're just going to pick off where Obama left off, much like he did the same with W, and this is it. I mean, this is it for us. I think that this is the last opportunity we have in 2012 to actually start turning this big, giant aircraft carrier of tyranny around back towards liberty. And I agree with you. And it's not just going to be Ron Paul. I mean, that's just the beginning because we're going to have to focus on other elections. You know, senatorial, congressional, state, and local. I mean, we got to be getting in to all these, you know, levels of government. We got to infiltrate. We have to get in there and we got to start turning things around because Ron Paul, even if he ends up being president, he can't do this by himself. Well, he needs the men and women in Congress to back his action. And he also needs lots of volunteers who are not from the East Coast corridor of the United States. We want people in the hinterlands who are very good at what they do, whether it's in law or in business. We want people to go to Washington and make it into a decent place where everything isn't fixed and everything doesn't belong to a criminal syndicate. Amen to that, Bob. I, I concur with that statement entirely. And it, it has to be done. we got to do this. we got to roll up our sleeves. we got to get into the fight. And I know so many people out there have been doing their part, and they feel like, well, I mean, what, what else can I do? And you just got to keep going. you got to keep, you know, up in your game and, you know, getting out there. I know it's difficult. It's not easy to do, but, you know, it's, it's what we have. We have no choice. I mean, it's – I'd rather, like you just mentioned a moment ago, Bob, I'd rather get this over with and resolved peacefully – then take up arms. I mean, I'm willing to go down fighting, but I don't want to do that. I, I'd rather start turning things around in this country in you know, the spirit of, of Gandhi, in the spirit of John F. Kennedy and Ron Paul. I'd rather go that way because I know what a violent revolution can turn into. It could end up 
actually making things far worse for us, believe it or not. There's a lot of people in the world who are intrinsically evil. And sometimes some of them find their way to the top of whatever, whatever it is. Uh, Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler were good examples. Brilliant, great leaders and evil people. And uh, we're going to have to deal with evil people. It is a profession uh, that is not only in the banking and financial sector and transnational corporations, but it exists in many places. We have to be ready for that. There's going to be people who want to take advantage of the situation. We can't let them do that. No, we can't. And the problem with you know people that you know go out there and they try and do something and they get the false illusion that they accomplished something like well the tea party <laughs> cough cough <laughs> you know they they go in they they say okay well we got a whole bunch of republicans elected to congress and the house and yeah we saved our country but all right well let's see what happened in the past couple months i'll just name a couple examples First off, um, oh, yeah, that's right, they extended the Patriot Act. That doesn't sound like something the Tea Party originally stood for. Um, oh, most recently, like we talked about at the beginning of the show today, they passed this uh, National Defense Authorization Act, you know, with a vote of 283 to 136. I mean, that it doesn't really sound like that the uh, Tea Party accomplished anything, Bob. And I think you're right. That's the way it's turned out. And, you know, these people, they go to Washington, and they arrive in November and December after they've been elected to find a place to live, and the lobbyists and chase them down immediately, come to dinner, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, and, -so, and uh, they tell them, well, this is the way it works in Washington. And so uh, we're prepared to give you, for your re-election campaign two years from now, um, uh, $75,000. But these are the things that are dear to our heart uh, that we hope you can help us with. And, of course, uh, if they don't help them, they don't get the money. And that's the way it works. Yeah, and that, that is a huge part of the problem. The, the lobbyists, the you know, powers that be, the corporate heads, the banksters, they just... They have most of our elected officials, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter, in their pocket from basically day one. And that's who our elected officials are unfortunately answering to. They're not answering to we the people, the taxpayer who are supposed to be their boss. They're answering to their masters. And that's for sure. And if we don't get Ron Paul in, if we don't get somebody who recognizes the way it's supposed to be, him serving the people... Not, not, not these big giant suits and elite creatures of the night <laughs> uh, who thinks that they can go into any country and take it over and, you know, run over the people. If we don't start getting more Ron Pauls in all levels of government, we're in serious trouble. And that's, that's where we are right now. We're at this crossroads. It's been building up for the past couple of years. Either we're going to go towards the – back towards – you know, freedom and liberty and a constitutional republic are we're going to fall into this abyss of tyranny and it's going to be just a step closer and faster towards their new world order agenda. I think people are looking at everything and the recent polls show the most important thing that they're looking at considering is the, in, 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 the intrusion of government in their lives. Uh, they don't call it a loss of constitutional rights. They don't call it a loss of liberty. They're just saying, look, I, I don't want the government in my face. I don't need this. I work too hard. I'm working two jobs. I'm trying to put kids through college. And these income poops, uh, they have 12 guys on an uh, enabling panel, and they can't even cut $1.2 trillion from a budget because they don't want to commit themselves politically. It's disgust is all that can be rendered to these people. And I want that to stop, says the average American, 70% for that matter. And so there's a great rolling thunder underneath the lives of Americans 
We have Bob back on the line. Uh, Bob, uh, sorry about the uh, phone issues. Uh, once again, we're having them like last week. Kind of suspicious how you uh, were just getting into the point about how uh, most Americans are, you know, seriously starting to wake up to all this. I mean, they, they're not saying, you know, the things we talk about, you know, the, the fact that it's a constitution and liberties and freedoms being eroded away. They just they see it in their, their own way. And you, you were talking about this storm that's brewing. It's a it's an un, it's under the, the the country. It's under the feet of the people. And like any other situation where people are unhappy, goodness knows what's going to trigger it to become active. And maybe it'll be very subtle. Or maybe it'll be one of these false flag events that the bankers plan and have uh, government execute. I don't know. But when it comes... Every politician in, in the country, if not the world, better go into hiding. And because it, it's going to be resounding, and it's not just going to be in America. Uh, you know, we talk to people all over the world in several languages, and they feel the same way Americans do. And these people come from all parts of society. In fact, some of the countries, what I've done with the students, when they come to me, I give them a free subscription on the proviso that they email it to everybody that they can email it to. And most of these kids throughout the world today, no matter what country they're in, if they're in university, they speak English. And that surprises Americans. I mean, there's places where up until 30 years ago, hardly anybody spoke English. Maybe 40 years ago. They do now. I mean, it may not be, uh, you know, super duper, but in some cases it is. It's funny. Sometimes I'll be speaking uh, Spanish to, to an attorney, and his son will come along, and I'll have a simultaneous conversation with him in English because his father can't speak English. But he can. He's 25, 26 years old. And this actually happened. And he's laughing like heck. He said, Dad, you should have gone to school. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, people throughout the world love Americans because they know how hard they work and how good-hearted they are. They hate our government. Have for a long, long time. And it's got to stop. It's got to end. And uh, maybe some of the dislike of Americans is paranoid or it's an excuse, but vice versa. And so uh, most people really like Americans, believe me. And I think they're going to like Americans even more if we can turn things around in our country. If we can, if we can get in there and get Ron Paul elected and start, you know, undoing all this crap that the, you know, several governments, not just the current administration and Congress, but past administrations and past Congresses have been putting in place for too long now, I think we're going to, you know, gain a huge amount of respect and admiration for the rest of the people of the world. And that's what I see as our way of influencing the peoples of the planet is not through our, you know, might of military or police, you know, going around nation building, but through setting the example for the rest of the world. And a lot of people, and we're going to get into some email questions as well. Uh, this one from Dennis. A lot of people, you know, are like, I love Ron Paul's local domestic policy, but I, I really can't support the foreign policy. Bob, why should people who talk like that, you know, support Ron Paul, especially because of his foreign policy? They have, don't have a clue to what they're talking about. They just don't. And they're going to resent that answer, but that's too bad. And what you're going to have to do is brush, brush up on the real facts of what's going on in foreign policy in America. It has been going on for a long time. It's evil. It's wrong. And, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's no justification for the wars that we've had. None of them. Most of you people will never serve in the military because you don't have to. Well, maybe if the Illuminists can arrange another war, maybe they'll arrange selective service for you, too, and you'll get to see what it's like to almost die. 
like the poor souls that have gone to the current conflicts. It was a time when people, the average person believed what government told them that the reasons for these wars we had, the Second World War, the Korean War, Vietnam, and then the first Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan. As we've gone further along, people found out, hey, the government hates us. And now they proved it by saying all the veterans that have come home are on the terrorist list. I mean, give me a break. I mean, some of these guys and gals are running around with no legs and no arms. And these lowlifes in Washington have the temerity to say such a thing and then not give them the medical care that they were promised. I gave up my spot in the VA a number of years ago. All I did was go get a physical every year. And, uh, and it was very good, actually. And uh, I had an appointment. Uh, the last one was about eight years ago. And I called him up and I said, look, uh, I can't make it and it's deliberate uh, because I want to give my spot up to someone who needs it more than I do. And uh, the woman doctor I talked to, she said, I wish everybody thought the way you did to stop milking the system. And I've never talked to her again since. But somebody else who had serious injuries was able to take my place. That's that's very admirable, Bob. And you you're talking about you know all these past wars and you know the most recent one, of course, is what the war in Iraq. And uh, well, today actually, uh, the U.S. lowered its flag there, marking the quote unquote official end to the Iraq War. The official death toll, even though uh, I've seen plenty of numbers where uh, it's both higher on both ends, they claim that 45 Americans were killed and 100,000 Iraqis died in the war. And I know that number is way off. I know it's way higher than that. With uh, U.S. troops being pulled out and more military contractors obviously coming into Iraq, along with the, this uh, National Defense Authorization Act passage, and probably going to be signed sometime this afternoon by Obama. I mean, the timing of the troops coming home from Iraq, I mean, looks a little convenient. But what, what's your take about uh, this situation and uh, how the Iraq War altogether over the past decade will be remembered by the history books and, of course, by future generations? A complete scam, and it's tragic that our young people had to go over there and fight people who didn't do anything. It's just a disgrace, and the people who arranged for us to be there, George Bush, should be tried and hung. He's a traitor to the American people, and there's many with him who should join him, and that's part of what this is all about. They're going for the whole enchilada, and we're going to stop them. And they're never going to do it again. And I, I think that we are getting to that point, a, a breaking point, as you were talking about a moment ago, the storm brewing, where people have had enough. I mean, you, you see the corruption. You, you see the growing police state around us, the erosion of, of everything, you know, law, uh, decency, freedom, liberties. And you, you see the, the unemployment numbers skyrocketing, along with food and gas and oil prices and the, uh, the fiat currency we have continuing to lose its value. I mean, it's just it's getting to a point where the, the people, I think, are going to erupt. I mean, it's going to be something, Bob. I don't know what it's going to be. Is, is it going to be a false flag event? Is it going to be a real attack? Or is it going to be a, a, a crash on Wall Street? But I, I, too, Bob, feel like that there's something in the works that's going to happen that's going to be basically the last straw. And it's growing more obvious every day. Uh, again, we don't know. It's just a feeling. And it's a professional feeling and, and in my case, because I've been doing this for so long. But there's something growing. I got an email today from London, and they're going to be making a film with a f friend of mine I've known since the early 60s. And this guy makes blockbuster stuff. And uh, it may be the one to turn everybody around. There's been a lot of great films, but uh, every once in a while a film comes along that says it all and is totally unexpected, and that could be the catalyst. And so uh, I hope it is.
Well, it is amazing by how much propaganda we have in you know the mainstream media, in uh, television, and of course coming from Hollywood, that every now and then a really good film comes out that like The Matrix or V for Vendetta or some other films that really opens people's eyes and it, it kind of pierces through the veil and I, I, I sincerely hope we have more films like that you know coming in the very near future and I mean I'm, I'm looking forward to you know seeing more films like that especially if this ends up being another big blockbuster and because we, we're in a very very bad situation I mean while you know it's good that more people are waking up the corruption is continuing to mount on us I mean I mean, look at Corazon in this MF Global scandal, okay? I mean, it continues to unravel, which is kind of a good thing. I mean, he claims that he didn't know where this $1.2 billion in customer money went. But Chicago CME Group Executive Chairman Terry Duffy is telling Congress that Corazon knew where the funds were taken before the uh, House Financial Services Committee. I mean, with this high starting to unravel, Bob, uh, could it possibly, and I say the word possibly because usually it doesn't end up this way, but is it very, very, is there a chance that Corzine and his fellow cohorts could be, you know, facing trial in, in a prison sentence? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Uh, never mind all the theatrics and some of the insane things people have been saying. Look, we have a court system, and we'll, we're going through a uh, dog and pony show at the House, at the Senate, blah, 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 and that's okay. Let the courts handle it. Now, I know the courts are unfair. They're prejudiced against us. Uh, they allow people like uh, Corzine to get away with things that they shouldn't and uh, makes it very difficult. But people have got to understand the most of the people who are commenting, there are a couple of exceptions, who are professionals in the commodity markets or they're in the stock market. These are professionals, people that have been there for years. When you open a margin account, you allow the firm to borrow the things in that margin account. It's called hypothecation, lending. And then they can rehypothecate them if they want. They might say to XYZ, we need a million dollars, and we have a million dollars here worth of collateral. They don't have to tell them where it's coming from. They just got it. And this is what it is. And that's what happened in this case. And the management made a terrible area, and the whole thing blew up on them, and the money was lost. Now, Corzine may have done something he shouldn't have done. I don't know, and neither does anybody else. And with that said about margin accounts, now you better understand why that happened. And it's legal. And people may not like the fact that they lost all that money, but they should have read the fine print. And there should be no tears shed for those people because they should have known what they were doing or did know in order to participate and speculate in those markets. Okay, if he did something wrong, we'll find out. Now, this thing has gone too far. It's not going to get covered up as much as they might try to. And then people are saying, well, all of the silver that was over there, you know, was shipped to uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Maybe that's so, but where's the proof? The numbers are similar, but I want to see the proof. I'm tired of seeing people popping off and giving out misinformation, or even though their heart might be in the right place, which is usually not the case, they're looking to expand their readership or their buyers of whatever they're selling. And so I look at them all with a jaundiced eye. And some of the vitriol, which has come from a number of people who had nothing to do with this thing. And I'm saying to myself, was this orchestrated? I don't know. But I do know that we should wait for judgment. We're not, most of you are not professionals in that field. I am. 
And we've got to see what the evidence is. I mean, these people have been dragged through the mud for the last six weeks. And they may be guilty of being jerks for making all of the terrible mistakes they made. Then again, they may have done something illegal. We don't know that yet. Or the United States government might have been behind the whole thing and they're trying to cover it up. Who knows? But we don't have enough evidence to run around saying that John Corzine's a crook. He may not be. He may be just made a stupid mistake or the government told him to spend every dime you had to keep that market up over there. We don't know. And that's why we have the system we have in America. And it's not perfect. The scales of justice are balanced. And they're usually out of balance. So let's wait and see what happens here. I'd like to take a number of these people to task for having said and done the things that they've done when they shouldn't have. It's not fair to the people involved and to the system itself. I mean, these people are talking about destroying every stock exchange in the world. They have decreed it. Now, I don't agree with that. Why should we destroy one of the main components of our civilization just to make sure that somebody is uh, convicted of something? I want well, the facts. I, yeah, I agree. I think that you know, we do need to get back to where we're, we're not having such a knee-jerk reaction to everything. And you know, giving people the opportunity to be you know, innocent until proven guilty you know, for everybody. And I, I think that is part of the problem. And something I talked about the other day on my podcast is that we always talk about this rabbit hole. It's long and deep. And, yeah, there are some tunnels of truth. But at the same time, there's plenty of tunnels out there that lead to dead ends and huge piles of rabbit pellets. And I think, Bob, you get what I'm saying. Well, that's why we have slingshots to (laughs) propel rabbit pellets. (laughs) Well, we're we're just about out of time. We got about a minute left, and uh, that's all I need. That's all you need. A minute left to tell us how you can get the international forecaster. The forecast is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world, published by email on Wednesdays and Saturdays, running around 35 to 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out to people who are not on the Internet twice a month. Everything you need to know every week is in that publication. You can get a free introductory copy by going to theinternationalforecaster.com, the International F O R E. C-A-S-T-E-R dot com. Or you can go to www.intforecaster dot com. Bob at intforecaster dot com. For those of you who want to have a question answered, we answer everyone. Uh, if you'd like a copy of either copy, or if you'd like a copy of our latest report on gold and silver shares, just email us. That address is Bob, B-O-B, at I-N-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com. Bob at intforecaster dot com. And for those of you who would like to call toll free, that number is 877-479-8178. 877-479-8178. You can get a free copy at that phone number. And for those of you who want to become subscribers, that's a good place to go because they have a special deal there for a full one-year free subscription. And if you want to be a subscriber, that's the place to go to. The deal that they're offering is terrific. It absolutely is, and it's a great gift for the holidays. Bob, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will talk to you next week, sir. You get it, and thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.